we are working um, in areas of trying to provide housing. Um, I just think that the rate that we're going is not going to be enough with the way the inflation is going right now. Uh, it's going to take, I believe, everyone's effort to get behind our community partners to, to really push what will work for them, what will work for the community, to be a voice to get out there in the community, get out there in the churches, get out there in the neighborhood, you know, say, we are here for you. Let them know that we're available. Let them know that we care, and let them know that they are important. Thank you. The next speaker is Courtney Ostrovel, and her question is, how did you keep your allies engaged with your social justice action plan? The funny thing about your question, Robert, is that you're implying I had a plan. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had a social justice uh, initiative plan, uh, but I have always had a North Star. And so, and, and part of that is because that's my personality. I, I tend to, um, not always have a plan. We give our teams at the launch pad an assessment for strengths and uh, it categorizes them into four different categories. And one of those categories is quick start, which is somebody who just like acts and does and isn't adverse to risk, maybe even enjoys risk. And I score as high as you can in a quick start category. <laughs> and another category is follow through, which is somebody who organizes and is linear and has a timeline. And I score as low as you can in the follow through category. But that doesn't mean that I just like am willy nilly about how I do things. So I, I do have a North Star, but I believe that the nature of the work that we do in social justice work, especially when it's um, local and community based, is that it's highly relational. And so sometimes a plan doesn't always work because a large part of that contingency that you're dealing with are human beings, and they're incredibly unpredictable. And so um, I do feel that I have a gift at holding space for a North Star and keeping my uh, attention on that, and then also listening deeply to the people around me and pivoting in ways that kind of always point north and invite people in. And so, um, as far as advocates and allies go, I've had a lot of unexpected allies and advocates over um, the 20 plus years that I've been working with teens. And some of that has been because I've had to find places where I might have a shared interest or a shared passion with somebody that I didn't think that we would ever connect. And in Prescott, there's a lot of people actually that I never thought I would connect with. Um, I started doing work for young women's empowerment based off of the teen pregnancy rate in Yavapai County. And so Yavapai County had one of the highest, still does have one of the highest teen pregnancy rates in the nation. And um, the school district, Arizona, had made a choice to move towards abstinence-only education. And I didn't believe that that was an effective strategy. But a lot of people thought that that was effective. So I made the assumption that there were a lot of people who I wouldn't be able to consider my ally in the work that I did. That was 20 years ago, and I was a lot younger and a little more arrogant, and, um, and did things differently. But I found unexpected allies because I had a lot of relationships in Prescott. I um, lived out of my car at the time, and I bartended at Zuma's, and most of my bar patrons were people who would let me house sit for them. Um, because they felt bad about me living out of my car. I was fine with it. I chose to live out of my car. Um, but I made lots of friends and lots of allies and people that I never expected that we would share a connection and a passion for helping teenage girls be empowered. And so it's like you start to build your allies through relationships, especially in a place like Prescott. Now that has all been deeply, deeply tested in the last four years. I say, um, my work has never been more challenging than it has been in the last four to six years. And I think all of the things that I learned in school, all of my experiences, all of um, the work organizing for this um, young women's organization that then became the Launchpad Teen Center, really got put to the test. And one of my approaches has always been, um, especially as I've matured some over 20 years, thank goodness, has been to look at other people and in my own spiritual practice to look at them and go, okay, and this works for me, so not for everybody, but they are a child of God just the same as I am. 
And so in what ways can that sort of um, humbling recognition move my work forward? And so some of the people who have been the most adamant about shutting down the launch pad because the launch pad has the audacity to serve all teens in Prescott, Arizona, including young people of color and LGBTQ youth. Um, so people who have wanted to shut us down because we are open and inclusive, I've tried to invite them in. And in every, uh, every moment, I've tried to invite them in. And so there have been times where we've had coffee together. There have been beautiful moments of, um, I had a, a woman who's part of a large group that's been very adamant about shutting us down, um, seek me out and apologize and said, I came to the launch pad for coffee to spy and uh, find all the things wrong with it. And all I see is this beautiful place that's a huge asset to the community. So what, a, what an incredible, um, courageous act on her part, truly. And so I kept her close, I kept her close, and I continue to have coffee with her, and she has become an ally over the last year, somebody I never would have anticipated. And then there's all your allies who are, you know, some, many of you, familiar faces who are out there. And I, I haven't always been good at my low follow-through piece, as low as you can be in the follow-through <laughs> category. I'm not always good at reaching out and stewarding relationships um, weekly or monthly. I'm better at, you know, picking up right where we left off after, after several months. But I've learned through this last four years how important it is, not just for me, but for all of us, that we continue to engage each other in a work in a way that feels like an invitation in rather than a way that feels like a battle cry, if that makes sense. Um, because I really do believe that the same, while I don't understand the actions of some of the people who are against the work that I do, I do know that it's coming from a place of fear, and I know what it feels like to be afraid. And so if I can see them in that way, and we can connect there, um, then maybe there's an opportunity for us to build an unexpected, positive relationship. And I've seen a lot of progress in that. So I don't have like a fancy formula for engaging your allies. Um, we send out newsletters if you're in any organization. I hope you do that too. Um, we also have volunteer opportunities. But the biggest piece that engages our allies is uh, my willingness to um, be vulnerable and reach out and my willingness to listen to our allies, especially the ones that I wouldn't typically see as an ally. The next speaker is James Kimes, and his question is, as a social justice advocate, who were your allies, and how did you get to know them? Well, part of what I said earlier answers that question. Uh, I worked with a lot of union leaders, politicians, both sides of the aisle, and community leaders, politicians, from my here. To answer that first question, though, and with an interest answer, why did I decide to become involved in social justice? And my answer is simple, because I found it necessary to do so. Uh, to, today, I make every effort to attend any and all peaceful demonstrations and protests, honor all boycotts, do not cross the picket line, and will often walk with those who are on strike in the spirit of unity and solidarity. Uh, uh, getting back to the allies, uh, to continue after uh, doing the NOICP terms, I got actively involved with uh, Reverend Warren Stewart in Phoenix, who led the two committees to make Martin Luther King holiday a legal holiday in Arizona. And those committees were Arizona for Martin Luther King Jr. State Holiday and Victory Together. Both committees were a broad-based coalition that campaigned for the holiday, which won by a historic vote of the people in the general election of September 3, 1962. In 2002, my good friend and special friend, Gwen, served as campaign commit. She and I served
served as campaign coordinator for Governor Napolitano when she first ran for office or as governor. And in March 2004, I was a candidate for state representative. 21 years ago, Gwen, who was with me with most everything I've done since then, uh, co-founded the St. Luke, uh, Christian, St. Luke Christian Center Ministries in Dewey, uh, thanks to our meeting up with Pastor Douglas Hobson when we attended one of the governor's inaugural days. And we simply went up to him asking if he would be, agree to be a pastor to our church. Our church was yet to be, and he agreed to be our pastor. Uh, he passed away, and now his daughter, Pastor Kendra Hobson, is our pastor. Uh, because of my active involvement with organized labor, to the extent allowed by law, covered by public employees, which I crossed that line a couple of times, uh, <laughs> Senator Leo Austin and I both were honored as lifetime honorary members of the Phoenix Fire Fighters Union Local 449. At that time, I had already volunteered for Leo Austin when I was a resident in her district in Phoenix years ago. Uh, it was very easy to have Lee Austin not only as an ally but as a friend. Uh, today she is still a state senator. I think she's the longest serving legislator in the history of Arizona. Uh, she's still a state senator and she is still one of my best friends and allies. When I worked at ADOT, my good friend Celestine Washington, who worked in the Tucson office, uh, she and I formed a diversity team in ADOT. We had the support of the ADOT directors at that time. We annually have a Martin Luther King program. Our last MLK program was in January 2001 which was dedicated to Mildred Jones, who was the NAACP president when I served on the board. But Mildred, Mildred Jones, incidentally, is the mother to former police chief of police, chief of police, uh, Jerry Williams. Uh, Mildred Jones was much more in the NAACP president. Everything she did was in pursuit of social justice. Everything she did was with kindness and love. Many community leaders attended our last program. So I had many allies within ADOT and other state agencies. My participation in the uh, effort to make Martin Luther King Jr. a, ho a holiday uh, had me connect up with other allies. Um, before, before I met, before I retired uh, from ADOT in 2001, two months after we had that very, very special MLK program, I met with Senator Ken Bennett to bring to his attention that the law related to cost of living increases for state retirees with age discrimination as written. I, he agreed that such was the case and he got the law changed to the benefit of all future retirees. At that time, he was certainly an ally. On another issue which I think is a social justice issue, um,
to have the retreat. Um, and after I was with her for a and after she passed, I discovered that she was abused and neglected, and that was documented from what the hospital had shown, had shown, shown to me. Um, the abuse and neglect that she suffered, and still goes on to this day, uh, caused me to organize in 2005 when I got back to from running for office and getting halfway normal. Uh, I organized a care home reform committee uh, with representatives from the governor's office legislators of both sides of the aisle, and Arizona Health Services was the director at that time, being Kathy Eden, a friend, uh, and Kathleen Collin Bagels, who was CIO, CIO of the Arizona Healthcare Association. We had quite a few meetings over a year period, and every representative from all those different organizations and government agencies were very, very understanding, very supportive, and very much agreed with the need to have reforms. Many of those recommendations were made, may cause policy changes, and some made law changes. Uh, to this day, we still have a long way to go to read the Arizona Republic on occasion to read about the neglect and abuse that people still learn of, mostly too late. Also working with local assisted living and care, care home administrators, we started a adopted care home program in Presque Valley. At that time, the Presley Valley Chamber of Commerce was also a great support. I, I think, I think my next part is our last question on what we talk. I think we're solely that for later. Uh, as far as allies go, I, I had allies in everything I did. I think the important thing about getting allies is reaching out to those who you might not think of as an ally. We also have to speak to those who might think differently than what we do. We often have the same goal, and we need to reach out and work together. Um, and I think I've done that, and it's been very, very rewarding. And I thank you all for being here. The next speaker is Jeff Daberman, and his question was, how would you define social justice allies, and did you gain any unexpected allies as part of your social justice work? Yes, thank you. Uh, that was actually quite a challenging, that first question, how would I define a social justice ally, was a bit of a challenging question for me. So thank you for the challenge. <laughs> The reason why it's a challenge is because as a middle-aged straight white man, I don't think it's really for me to define what a social justice ally is. Like you, I'm here to listen and to learn. I am going to answer this question though with this context because I have, through my life, I've had many mentors and peers and friends and colleagues who exemplify a set of qualities that I aspire to emulate when it comes to being a social justice ally. I love these people. Some of them I go way back with and some of them I've known for only a short time, but they all have many things in common. It begins with um, as someone who seeks to build trust with an overall willingness to engage in life and the courage to step into the arena and dare greatly. It is never performative and it does not fall prey 
that the culture war trappings of identity politics. Social justice work is bigger than merely being right. It is work that demands the ego take a back seat to a commitment to common humanity. I have a list of qualities here that I want to run through. And I'll say a couple things about each of them, but these qualities are what I believe make up a, a, what I try to be as a social justice ally. I know that this is not an exhaustive list or a complete list by any means. But at the top of that list is that a social justice ally is someone who listens with curiosity and are open to moving past assumptions and echo chambers. Understanding that learning never ends. This is not something that anybody has a monopoly on or knows everything about. We have to stay open all the way through. Hand in hand with listening with curiosity is the capacity for empathy and compassion. Social justice allies seek authentic connection and recognize that the real revolution is the evolution of consciousness. This is how we move forward together. And anything that is not this is a barrier to it. A very important quality of a social justice ally is someone who leans into discomfort. We have to accept that being uncomfortable is imperative to growth, and being vulnerable is a part of being uncomfortable. Now, for the white people in the audience, I want to say that leaning into discomfort means directly to interrogate your whiteness. Know your history, and know the history of this country, and know how that impacts people who are not like you and don't look like you. Dig into that. I promise you it's uncomfortable. And if you're comfortable doing that, you're probably not doing the work. Get uncomfortable with it. One thing about uh, leaning into discomfort is that we need to be able to accept that humans have limitations. We are all flawed, fallible human beings who make mistakes. And so do the people who oppose the things that we stand for. We need to be able to accept our own limitations. And we need to be able to accept the limitations of other people who maybe just don't know. In that, uh, in that mindset, being self-reflective and having a willingness to learn and adapt and really do the work of looking within that's where it all begins, right? It begins within. Sit with your cognitive dissonance. Recognize what it means to be self-reflective in the context of being a social justice ally. A social justice ally recognizes privilege and how to use it. That includes centering the well-being of marginalized populations. You know, on Thursday night, uh, MLB, Major League Baseball, uh, had an event at Brickwood Field in Birmingham. Uh, it was a special tribute to the Negro Leagues. It was really neat. And amidst the spectacle of this event, though, uh, Hall of Fame baseball player Reggie Jackson was asked to speak a little bit at the pregame show. And I asked him what was it like, because he played in Birmingham for the minor league Oakland A's uh, in 1967 in Birmingham. That was the height of the civil rights movement, I'm sure many of you know. First thing he said is, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Right? I would never want to do it again. He talked about it, gave some examples of the way he was treated. And then he shifted, though. He said, you know what? I'm so grateful for my white manager and my white teammates, he was the only black person on the team. He said, they have my back, basically. 
because we would go somewhere to uh, get a meal or stay overnight and they would point at Reggie and they would say, no. And his teammates got his back. They said, if he doesn't stay, we don't stay. If he doesn't eat, we don't eat. And this is going on you know, over 50 years ago and Reggie told that story like it could have happened yesterday. That's very moving for me when it comes to being a social justice ally. Recognizing privilege means uh, that we need to be willing to see power in space. Recognizing privilege means that we need to consider strongly who gets the benefit of the doubt. And I'll talk to the white people again in this audience. If a black person tells you a story that maybe doesn't sound believable, it's probably true. Social justice allies need to be willing to take a principled stand, whether it is out in public in front of the mic or behind closed doors or in a Zoom meeting. They have to have the courage to lead, even versus Steve Odds. One of the most um, venerable, fictional American social justice allies that I believe uh, in my life is Atticus Finch. Yes, to kill a mockingbird. But I want to read a quote from Atticus toward the end of the book. He's talking with his daughter, Jem, and he says, I wanted you to see what real courage is. Instead of, instead of getting the idea that courage is a man with a gun in his hand, it's when you know you're licked before you begin, but you begin <coughs> anyways, and you see it through no matter what. You rarely win but sometimes you do. Folks talk is cheap, and uh, to be willing to take a principled stand, integrity and resilience is required. Taking a principled stand means having the ability to discern when to step up and when to step back, but regardless, still showing up with the consistency of your values. A social justice ally is ideally emotionally regulated. This is a challenging one for me. I'm very passionate. But staying calm and communicating clearly to de-escalate a tense situation is a real attribute. Social justice allies are grounded in fact-based reality. Practicing having observations without judgment leads to sound decision-making. Social justice allies understand the big picture and prioritize what is important. A lot of times we can get caught up in the minutia of what's happening right now. It is important to be able to take a step back and make sure what we are doing now is actually building towards the larger goals that we hope to achieve. The ability to slow it down and see a broader perspective is very important. And finally, social justice allies let love lead. I believe very strongly that love is greater than fear. And I think that we all know that behind hate and anger ultimately is fear. A commitment to nonviolence is a very important part of this uh, quotient. In 2019, I was in Montgomery, Alabama. I visited the Dexter Street Church where Dr. King was the pastor during the Civil Rights Movement. The Dexter Street Church is in the shadow of the Alabama State Capitol. In 1967, Dr. King gave a speech from that pulpit called Loving Your Enemies. And there's a there's a line in that speech that I really try and bear in mind anytime I start to waver. And it's this. He says, I love you. I would rather die than hate you. I'm not sure there's a more powerful sentence in the English language. And this is what I try to live up to, to try and come back to when I think about what being an ally is and what's showing up for the people who I 
hope would consider me an ally. I want to bring love first. And so this is what I try to do. Now, there's a second part of this question, um, and I'll answer it very briefly. Yes, I have social justice allies who are unexpected. And that's a great thing. Uh, but I gotta say, I would be remiss to say that I'm a little disappointed in all the people who I think should know better and still haven't shown up. And so part of what I want to do is try and echo what Courtney was saying, is to invite those people in. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Jeff made me remember something that I heard on the radio about Eagle. And uh, Eagle is the anesthesia that deadens the pain of stupidity. <laughs> you might have some friends you want to share that with. <laughs> the next speaker is Howard Mechanic. And his question, and this question was written just for him. Were any new laws created or social changes implemented as a result of your social justice action plan? Well, uh, I'm going to be like Courtney and start out with a joke, too, because talk about a plan. Uh, it was my plan to end the war in Vietnam. I'm not taking credit for that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, and then the implication is that a lot of people have had the understanding. You may have heard the quotation from Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And I used to believe that. But a small group of dedicated individuals cannot change the world. Dr. King could not change the world. He needed thousands of people as allies. And you're talking about allies. You cannot do it as an individual. So the question sort of implies that I had a plan, and as an individual, I was able to implement that plan. It, that do, it doesn't happen that way. Uh, unless you're the President of the United States, you can't have a plan implemented by yourself. <coughs> Even then, there's very severe limits on the power of the President. I want to back up, therefore, and back up to 1912. And what, what happened in 1912 here? We became a state. In 1912, was, we were to sort of the end of the progressive era. A lot of people don't even know that we were progressive <laughs> at one time. And Arizona was more progressive than just about any place else. If you recall, at that time, the population was dominated by miners. 